weeks ago, I gave my election-themed homily. And as I shared at that time, I tried to give only one per election season, since we all get fatigue from the way in which political themes bleed into everything at this time of year. Now, of course, the purpose of that homily was not to parse the merits or faults of particular candidates, but to provide a primer and refresher on the Catholic principles which must inform our consciences as we exercise our roles as faithful citizens. Today, on All Saints Day, I would like to step back and get some greater perspective, how we get beyond politics. However, before I begin the meat of the homily, I feel obliged to cover one topic that has been a source of confusion and contention as it pertains to the election, due to the fact that our shepherd, Cardinal DiNardo, felt fit to make a point of it this week. In discussion of one of the four core principles of Catholic social teaching, the dignity of the human person, we discussed the importance of the sanctity of life. Now, life issues are very polarizing at this time of year because often one candidate or party can stand against abortion while another candidate or party may favor its legal protection while promoting other policies that would help protect human dignity in other ways. To what weight should abortion be given in making a choice? It's obviously a huge issue but on the other hand, it's clearly far from the only issue. In the introductory letter to the bishop's teaching document, Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship, they address this dilemma using this language. Quote, The threat of abortion remains our preeminent priority because it directly attacks life itself, because it takes place within the sanctuary of the family, and because of the number of lives destroyed. At the same time, we cannot dismiss or ignore other serious threats to human life and dignity, such as racism, the environmental crisis, poverty, and the death penalty." End quote. So the bishops describe abortion as the preeminent issue or priority, but nonetheless people are wondering, what does this mean? The problem, as faithful, citizen, faithful citizenship points out, is that some try to manipulate this tension towards one extreme or the other in order to politicize it. On one extreme, some try to use the fact that abortion is a preeminent issue as an excuse to ignore other serious issues or threats to life and human dignity, which also must be addressed according to the demands of the gospel. This was the intention of the late Archbishop of Chicago Cardinal Bernadine, as he tried to bridge ideological divisions and the culture wars in the, in the 1980s by pointing to the fact that the gospel does not allow us to pick and choose which people we value or care about. Preoccupation with any one issue cannot prevent us from addressing other critical moral issues. Or said differently, efforts at reform do not have to be mutually exclusive. This was the intention or theory that led to the promotion of the so-called seamless garment theory. But on the other hand, the seamless garment idea was exploited and manipulated by politicians and partisan activists who supported social programs but failed to oppose abortion and yet wrongfully claimed to be faithfully practicing their Catholic faith. As Pope John Paul II noted in Christi Fidelis Leici in 1988, quote, the common outcry, which is justly made on behalf of human rights, for example, the right to health, to home, to work, to family, to culture, is false and illusory if the right to life, the most basic and fundamental right, and the condition for all other personal rights is not defended with maximum determination." End quote. The issue is one of ethical distinctions. There are many serious moral issues, but this does not mean that all are equivalent. 
And so this is the reason why our Archbishop, Cardinal DiNardo, who was president of the USCCB when the latest edition of Faithful Citizenship was ratified by the entire body of bishops, felt it important to clarify the issue this week in the Texas Catholic Herald. He, quote, said, There was a vigorous discussion on the word preeminent used to describe abortion amidst a number of serious and grave moral issues. Some took exception to the adjective, but the bishops overwhelmingly supported it because abortion attacks right now unborn human life, and this direct assault is preeminent among moral issues. In recent days in public remarks at a university and in an article in America Magazine, Bishop Robert McElroy, ordinary of San Diego, has written on the issue and has muddied the waters by using preeminent to describe both abortion and a number of other moral evils. That is not what the bishops wrote and agreed upon. Abortion was distinguished as preeminent among a number of serious moral issues." End quote. As faithful citizenship clearly articulates, the direct and intentional destruction of innocent human life from the moment of conception until natural death is always wrong and is not just one issue among many. It must always be opposed. It is an issue of distinction. We cannot be single-issue voters, nor simplify all political questions to be about abortion. At the same time, we cannot prioritize other important moral issues and ignore the elephant in the room that we are in the midst of a horrifying holocaust in our nation, with over 60 million lives lost in the United States to abortion since 1973. At her speech for accepting the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979, St. Teresa of Calcutta, the famous saint who dedicated her entire life to charity and to care of the poor, the sick, and the discarded, cut to the heart of the matter. Quote, I feel the greatest destroyer of peace today is abortion, because it is a direct war, a direct killing, direct murder by the mother herself. And we who are standing here, our parents wanted us. We would not be here if our parents would do that to us. Our children, we want them, we love them, but what of the millions? Many people are very, very concerned with the children in India, with the children in Africa, where quite a number die, maybe of malnutrition, of hunger, and so on. But millions are dying deliberately by the will of the mother. And this is what is the greatest destroyer of peace today, because if a mother can kill her own child, what is left for me to kill you, and you kill me? There is nothing between. End quote. These are extremely bold words that cut to the heart of things. And not just empty words, but perspective from one who walked the walk. Such is the witness of the saints, who cut beyond the lowly rhetoric of worldly ideologies and speak to the truth of the gospel. Hence the importance of today's solemnity, All Saints Day. After all the feast days we celebrate throughout the year for the many canonized saints, we venerate today all the other saints, those who, although not formally canonized, have gone to their eternal reward in heaven. We do not pray for the saints. They have no need of our prayers. But we are called to model ourselves upon them, to seek their intercession, and to be reminded of our own calling to be saints. In this, we can be inspired by the apostles and early church fathers and martyrs. And we can also follow the lives of modern saints, 
such as Mother Teresa or Pope St. John Paul II. Teresa of Calcutta amazed the world by her tireless work to care for and show love to the most di discarded of society. As she said, each one of them is Jesus in disguise. Mother Teresa was a woman of action, but at the heart of her ministry was an incredible devotion to the Eucharist. She claimed that the only way to see Jesus in the poor was to recognize him because of the time spent with him. Likewise, Pope St. John Paul II captivated the world through his bold witness, his courageous witness against communism, his joyful dedication to youth, and his deep piety and personal asceticism, not to mention his dignified acceptance of the sufferings of his final years as he was crippled by Parkinson's disease. Both of these saints were agents of peace and change without ever leading an army. This brings me to a story of St. Francis of Assisi that re-entered the Catholic consciousness thanks to the new encyclical from Pope Francis titled Fratelli Tutti, the story of St. Francis and the Sultan. During the Fifth Crusade in the early 1200s, there was a long and bloody siege of the Egyptian city of Damietta held by the Christians on the part of the Sultan of Egypt, Palestine, and Syria. Malek al-Kamil, the nephew of the infamous Saladin. Al-Kamil was looking to end this impasse, in which both sides were guilty of savage atrocities by offering gold to anyone who brought him the head of a Christian. St. Francis of Assisi decided to cross enemy lines to talk to the Sultan himself. After being captured, Despite the fact that the Sultan was a pious Muslim, Francis attempted to convert him, not by superior argumentation, but by the witness of gospel love. He shared with the Sultan the fullness of gospel truth, and so amazed the Sultan that he was given a stay from the execution that the Sultan's advisors wished to carry out. After all, to attempt to convert someone away from Islam was punishable by death. Instead, the Sultan was amazed by the bold and courageous witness of Francis and kept him as his guest before allowing him to depart amicably. As Francis spoke with sincere love and refused any gifts he was offered, he softened the heart of the Sultan, who began to seek from that day more peaceful resolutions to the bloody war. Both men were changed for the better, and St. Francis succeeded where military conflict and worldly diplomacy failed. Fast forward to last month, when blessed Carlo Acutis was beatified, the final step before canonization. Carlo was an Italian boy who died in 2006 at the age of 15. He was not a priest, not a monk, not someone who accomplished mighty deeds by the world's standards. He was a teenager who loved playing video games and researching on the internet and had a contagious sense of humor. His holiness was demonstrated through his desire to overcome his own passions and sins, to live the ordinary and extraordinary ways to encourage others his age to live holy lives and to help all of the poor that he met. Passionate for the Eucharist and in wonder over Eucharistic miracles, his devotion brought his mother, who had rarely attended Mass, and their housekeeper, a Hindu, to the Catholic faith. When diagnosed with leukemia, he offered his sufferings for the Pope and for the Church. Now, this modern boy is a new model of faith. His inspiration, you might ask? None other than St. Francis of Assisi. Holiness 
is contagious. When we emulate the Holy Ones and cooperate with God's grace, we too can become holy as God calls us to be. And we never know how in turn others will be impacted by our holiness and brought to the love of Christ. As we celebrate All Saints Day, just two days before Election Day, we are reminded that no matter who wins on November 3rd, we will still celebrate the Solemnity of Christ the King on November 22nd to remind us of where true power lies. As I wrote in my bulletin letter for the week, as much weight as we put in elections and political agendas, economic plans, the only thing that will ever truly advance peace in the world is personal holiness and the spread of the gospel, not through crafty or loud biting arguments, but through the witness of love. Love of this kind does not require a movement, a leader, or a Twitter account. St. Teresa of Calcutta once challenged that we begin not by great plans, but by merely loving the person right in front of us, and then the next one, and so on. As she commented, if you are overwhelmed by the prospect of feeding 100 people, then feed one. She constantly challenged people that we need not obsess over doing great things but to simply do the things we do with great love. If you are disillusioned with our political process, our candidates, or even the winners of this upcoming election, remember upon the model of the saints that lasting change always starts with you and with me.